Hey everyone, welcome back to Creative Raw. My name is Chris O'Donnell and thanks for joining me for another Photoshop tutorial here. In this tutorial, we're gonna take a deep dive into what layer masks are. I find that many photographers think they know how layers and layer masks work, but they really don't. And this causes a lot of confusion, a lot of time wasted, and just making Photoshop 100 times more complicated than it needs to be. Photoshop has done an excellent job of making layers quite easy to use. So I can't wait to show you how all of this works. As we've already learned, layers are your control station for image processing in Photoshop. However, in order to unlock the full power of layers and be able to reap the ultimate rewards here, you need to also use layer masks so you can tailor whatever adjustments you're making with your layers here to the content of your photograph in order to get the results you want. Layer masks allow you to create 100% custom adjustments that can hug every nook and cranny of your mountains, your trees, the horizon line, for example, in this photograph here. What if I wanted to isolate this wall and this little turret here and the rocks surrounding it in order to add some contrast or bring out some more texture? But I don't want to affect any other part of my photograph. Well, with a regular layer, you can't do that unless you use a layer mask with it. That's what we call local adjustments, where you target the exact areas you want to adjust while ignoring areas you want to be excluded from that adjustment. Or another example here, the blue in the sky is looking a little dull and muted. So maybe you want to add some saturation or some deeper, more vibrant blues just to the sky, but not to the foreground here, which is already very saturated. Layer masks will allow you to do that very easily and non-destructively. So using a mask, it's really the key difference between an average photograph and an image that's been expertly processed to the highest quality. Now you can make local adjustments over in Lightroom or ACR to some degree. You can paint in adjustments with your adjustment brush tool or your radial or grad filters. But most of the time, the results can be either very sloppy or very difficult to achieve. And even with the new masking panel, don't get me wrong, it's great that Lightroom has added this capability, but it's still very limited because the controls you use for selecting, they're either automated, which can give you inconsistent results, or they just aren't precise enough for what you want to achieve. For advanced selections where you really want to isolate very specific, intricate areas, you really want to be in Photoshop proper for that. For example, if I zoom in a little bit here, if I wanted to make an adjustment to the sky in the background, but exclude this rock turret here, I would need to take my brush tool and trace out the bit of sky here and the bit of sky here and have to go along these very intricate edges. And then of course, once we get down to the rocks, that would be very difficult to achieve. Even with the new masking panel, the sky selection tool wouldn't be 100% accurate here. So you would need to do a lot of work to clean that up in Lightroom, as opposed to just making the correct selection in Photoshop the first time around. Now layer masks, they allow you to blend the best parts of multiple layers together into one photograph by hiding portions of your top layer to reveal one or more layers underneath. So in the example I just mentioned where I wanted to increase the saturation of just the sky, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to hide the saturation increase from the foreground ocean and beach here and only want to increase the saturation of the blue in the sky. So we're basically going to cut a hole, so to speak, in that saturation adjustment layer in order to reveal the original photo layer underneath it. However, layer masks, they can also be used for pixel-based adjustments like exposure blending or focus stacking. For example, if I wanted to blend an entirely different sky here, perhaps instead of this long exposure, I have another frame that has the cloud stationary. I could stack that frame on top of this image here and use my mask to cut a hole in the foreground so that the foreground of the original image comes through. So the end result here would be a final image with this foreground and a different sky. In layer masks, they're also a mandatory prerequisite if you want to learn any advanced workflows here in Photoshop that I'll be showing you later, such as exposure blending and luminosity masks and color grading. So layer masks, they're very important to learn, especially early on in your Photoshop journey. Okay, so now let's get into how a layer mask actually works. So I have my image here and we're going to increase the saturation of the sky without affecting the foreground colors at all. So the first step here is to add a hue and saturation adjustment layer and simply increase the saturation. And just so you know, this isn't how I would typically increase the saturation of a photograph. I'm just using this as an example. There are more accurate and non-destructive ways to adjust your saturation. So right now the sky is looking pretty good, but the foreground is definitely oversaturated. So we need to scale back on that. And before I show you how the mask actually works, you really should practice mask yourself hands-on. So I encourage you before we move any further to download the practice file 
so you can process right along with me step by step. There will be a link underneath this video for that. Countless studies have shown that not only will this hands-on practice help you with your comprehension, but it'll also help you remember the steps taught when you actually do them yourself. You'll remember more when you're actually doing it as opposed to simply watching what I'm doing. So download that practice file via the link below, and it also includes the video file for this tutorial. So you can watch it offline at your own leisure. Okay, so this white box right here to the right of my adjustment layer is the layer mask. Now by default, all adjustment layers will come with a mask automatically because Photoshop knows you would typically want to tailor the adjustments you're making to the photo. However, if you need to add the mask yourself, let me delete this mask here. First, make sure to click on the thumbnail for that layer and then go down here. There's a white box with a circle in the middle of it. That is your add layer mask icon. So click on that and the mask will appear. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna demonstrate how to use the mask so you can see the actual benefit of it. And then we'll go over the step-by-step -step process of how the mask actually works. So the first step here would be to click on the layer mask, make sure that it's active with that white box around it. I'm gonna press B to grab my brush tool. Make sure my foreground color is filled with black so that I'm painting with black. Make sure my brush is big enough to cover the area I want. And I'm just gonna start painting over the areas I want to remove this saturation increase from, which is the foreground and that stone wall along the horizon. And you can see the mass reflects the brushing I just did. The bottom half of my image is black while the top half remains white. So let's do a quick before and after here. This is before the mask. And here is the after. This is after I made that change to the mask by applying black to the areas I want to remove the saturation from. So it works like the eraser tool really. However, the difference being is that you are not actually erasing the content of your layer, you're simply hiding it with the mask. So essentially, the mask allows you to reveal or conceal certain parts of the layer you are masking. And that's why it's called a mask. So the power with the mask, as opposed to simply erasing the content, is that I can come back with a white brush. Let me switch my foreground color to white. I can come back with this white brush at any time and bring the content of that layer back. So you can see I'm brushing over my foreground again and that saturation increase is now being revealed. So with the layer mask, I can hide or reveal that adjustment at any time, either entirely or only certain parts of that layer. And that's what's called a non-destructive workflow, since you are not permanently changing the pixels of the image. Now, I'm sure you have lots of questions about masks right now. How do they work? Why did I use the brush tool here? Why am I painting with black and white and so on? But don't worry, layer masks, they're very simple to understand once they're explained properly and fully. So keep watching and I promise it'll all fall into place shortly. So in order to better understand how layer masks work, I'm gonna add a new blank layer. Actually, let me delete the saturation increase. I'm gonna add a blank layer, and I'm gonna fill it with a color. So you can see exactly what is happening to our layer when we adjust the mask. So in order to add a mask to your layer, first you need to make sure that the layer is selected and active. Then you go down to the bottom of your layers palette like I showed you earlier, click on the add layer mask icon, and now you have your mask. When you add that layer mask, this new thumbnail appears to the side of your layer, and by default, it's going to be filled with white. Now, looking at it here in the layers palette, it appears that we simply just added a white layer to the layer. They look very similar. However, the function of the layer mask is completely different from the layer itself. And you'll notice here that we have this little icon here that represents a chain link, and it indicates that the layer mask is linked to this layer. So any work you do to that mask is going to affect the layer that it's linked to. Now, nothing has changed yet with this image because we haven't done anything to the layer mask yet. All we've done is simply add a mask. This mask still needs your instructions on how it should interact with your layer here. Okay, so here's how a layer mask works to control the transparency of the layer that it's attached to. You need to fill this layer mask with content by either using your brush tool like I demonstrated earlier, or you can use your paint bucket, your gradient tool, or other selection tools at your disposal. But I usually use the brush tool. But either way, you're using one of these tools to fill that mask with content in order to control the visibility of your layer. So what you do here is you add white, black, or any shade of gray in between white and black to the mask itself. And that's gonna tell Photoshop how transparent you want that particular area of your layer to be. So if I go ahead and add black to this layer mask, I'm gonna do that by selecting my paint bucket, make sure my foreground color is set to black, and that my layer mask is selected, not the layer itself. I'm gonna click once, and now you can tell by the thumbnail, the layer mask is completely filled with black. And that orange layer has now completely disappeared. So when you add black to a mask, that layer it's attached to, it's 100% invisible. 
Now if I add pure white to my mask, switch my foreground color to white, have my layer mask selected, gonna click once again, now that layer is completely visible again. So black will conceal your layer and white will reveal your layer. That's a very handy saying to keep in mind when you're thinking of how to work with your layer mask. And if you add any shade of gray to your mask, that layer will be transparent by a certain percentage, depending on how light or dark your gray is. So if I add a very light gray, to this mask. You can see we now have a blending of both layers since that mask is telling that orange layer to be just a little bit transparent. And now if I go ahead and add a darker gray, something like this, you can see that the orange layer is now almost completely invisible. It's still there a little bit. If I turn this off and on, you can see there's a little bit of orange there, but it's mostly invisible and we're seeing most of the content underneath, which is our original photograph. Now we'll discuss how gray works on a layer mask later, but for now let's just focus on pure black and pure white. So let me get rid of this layer mask here for a second. Now when I add a new layer mask, the default is 100% white. And that's why you can still see the entire layer when you add a layer mask, because it's still 100% visible. However, when I fill that layer mask with black, that orange layer now becomes completely hidden, allowing you to see the original photo layer underneath. For example, I take my brush tool here, fill it with black, and I start brushing over the mask we are revealing the content underneath that layer. So when you want to hide part of your layer, you use black. When you want to reveal part of your layer, you use white. Actually, Photoshop knows this because if you keep an eye on my foreground and background color, right now it's a color, it's that orange. But when I click on the layer mask, that foreground color now becomes completely desaturated. We're looking at the gray value for that color. This is because you cannot paint color onto the actual layer mask. The mask is not for adding content, but rather controlling the transparency of that layer content. Another way to visualize how a layer mask works is to not think of painting black, white, or gray onto the mask, but rather visualize light and shadow. When you shine a light on something, when you add white to it, it becomes visible. When you cast a shadow over something, or rather when you add black to the mask, it becomes less visible. And if you add a partial shadow or gray, then it becomes somewhat visible. So essentially what you're doing here is that you're cutting holes into your layer with the mask. And these holes are of varying degrees of transparency. They can be any shape or size you want. However, these are not permanent holes since you can come back with a white brush or at least a brush that is lighter than the existing brushwork on your mask and paint over it to lighten that area or rather shine more light onto it and bring the content of that layer back. And as I mentioned earlier, this is called a non-destructive workflow because you're not changing the actual pixels of your layer like you would with your eraser tool, but rather you're simply hiding or revealing those pixels. Or in the case of adjustment layers, you're hiding or revealing the adjustment itself. Another way to look at this is that you're using your brush tool or whatever tool you end up using to add black, white, or gray to your mask that you are selecting an area to apply the layer to. I see many photographers, they get really confused with the idea of painting black, white, or gray onto the mask because you don't actually see that on the image itself. You're not painting those colors onto your image. Looking at the thumbnail for the mask here, we can see the black brush strokes over the layer mask. So those black, white, and gray areas, they're just a way for you to visualize where you are selecting to apply the layer to or rather where you are selecting to make that layer visible or invisible. It's basically just an overlay that indicates layer transparency. All right, so now that you know the basics of how a layer mask functions, let's discuss adding gray onto your mask. Cause that's a little different than adding pure white or pure black to it. So here's a big picture idea behind using gray on a layer mask. The opacity of your layer or the transparency of it is in direct relation to the shade of gray you use on your layer mask. For example, if you add a 50% gray color onto the layer mask, which is the midpoint between white and black on the value scale, then your layer will only be 50% visible. Now, if this seems confusing at all, don't worry. It's a bit difficult to understand layer masks without visual aids. So let's go over a couple examples of layer masking. I'm gonna get rid of this mask and start over with a fresh one. I'm gonna go over and select my rectangular marquee tool. I'm gonna drag a square over my image here in order to select the area I want to change. This is one of several selection tools here in Photoshop. And essentially what this does, it allows you to mark out the boundaries of the area you want to adjust. These marching ants, as we call them, define that boundary. So this works like a stencil where you can paint or otherwise fill the area within the boundaries of that selection. And it's not going to change anything outside of that boundary, or rather outside of the selection. So now what you wanna do is make sure that the layer mask is selected, not the layer itself. Then I'm gonna press B to activate my brush tool. I'm gonna to go up to color here and select a 50% gray. 
for my color. So the exact midpoint between black and white, and make sure that it's your foreground color down here, not the background. If it is, you simply press X to switch those colors back and forth. Now I'm gonna take my brush tool, I'm gonna to paint over the selection here onto the layer mask. And notice, even though I'm painting way outside of the boundaries, it's not changing that content. It's only affecting the area inside of that selection. You notice here on the layer mask thumbnail, I now have that gray square on my layer mask. So now with that 50% gray on the layer mask, you can see that the orange layer is only somewhat transparent now. It's 50% transparent to be exact. So here we're seeing the combined result of our image layer underneath and a somewhat opaque layer of orange with our mask. So this is how your layer mask interacts with your other layers. If we go all the way back to the example at the beginning of this video, when I added that saturation increase and then masked out the foreground. Actually, let me turn this off for a second here. The white area was over our sky, so that saturation increase was visible over the sky, but the foreground here was black. That mask was hiding the saturation increase from the foreground. So we go ahead and add a curves adjustment layer. I'll show you another example of this. Bring down the luminosity, or rather the lightness, just a little bit. Go into blues. Gonna bring this up a little bit, just to make my sky a little more blue here. Okay, so this is for the sky only, so I'm gonna click on my layer mask, get a black brush. Get my brush tool, and again, I'm gonna paint over the foreground in order to hide this adjustment fully from my foreground. However, let's say I want this adjustment to be visible on these foreground rocks here, but not at full strength, only at a certain percentage. So I'm gonna adjust the color of my brush tool and bring it down to right around 50%. So it's only 50% visible. And I'm just gonna click once on these rocks here. So click before and after, this is before. I added that gray brush to the rocks and here is the after. And here is the before and after of the entire adjustment as a whole. So let's take a look at the layer mask in full so we can see exactly what's going on here. I'm gonna press Alt on my keyboard and click on the layer mask so we're looking at it as an overlay on the image. And we can see that the sky is completely white, meaning the adjustment is fully transparent on the sky. The foreground is completely black, except for those rock areas that I painted gray onto. So here, the adjustment isn't at full strength. It's only in 50% opacity at most. So right now it's a 50-50 split between that curse adjustment and the original content. However, if I wanted to lessen the effect even more, say I only wanted 20% visible, I can go up here and make my gray 80% black like this. Let's click off the layer mask here and simply hit those areas again to somewhat remove this adjustment. So now this adjustment is only 20% visible on the rocks, but 100% visible on the sky. So the point here is that the opacity or the transparency of that layer is in direct relation to the shade of gray you add to the mask. Since we added 80% gray to the layer mask, we can now see 80% of the underlying layer, or rather only 20% of the layer that the mask is attached to. So there are many ways to add black, white, or gray to your layer mask in order to reveal or conceal the layer itself. The most common way is to simply use your brush tool and paint onto the mask like I demonstrated earlier. But there are other ways to fill your mask with content, so I want to be very clear on how this process actually works. The way the layer mask works is first you make a selection where you are telling Photoshop where you want to add black, white, or gray to on your layer mask. In other words, you're outlining an area you want to mask, like we did earlier with this square selection here. Then once the boundaries have been drawn out, then you can fill that area with black, white, or gray. Now with the brush tool, it's a little bit different because you're doing two things at once. You are selecting the area you want to mask, and then you're also filling that area you are painting over at the same time, which is why it's the most popular choice for your mask work. You don't have to drag out a selection first and then fill it. You can do both things at once. And also the brush tool gives you complete freehand control of exactly where you want your mask to appear. So to do that, you would press B to bring up the brush tool. Then you would make sure that you have the layer mask selected that you want to adjust. Then you would adjust the brush size by using your left and right bracket keys in order to make your brush bigger or smaller. Now I have another video all about using the brush tool, so you can reference that for more detail on how the brush actually works. But these two swatches right here, your foreground and your background color, these are very important when working on a layer mask. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can only select black, white, or gray with your color picker here. When working on a layer mask, you can't fill it with actual color. So if I go ahead and choose a very bright, vibrant red, hit OK, that's not going to come up as my foreground color. 
only the grayscale equivalent of that color will be chosen. Now, actually, I don't want a gray for my foreground color, so I'm going to press D on my keyboard, which stands for default, the default brush colors, which are pure black and pure white. Since you use those colors frequently when masking, those are your defaults. So right now my foreground color is set to white, but if I wanted to use black, I don't have to go into my color picker in order to change that, nor do I have to adjust the color slider up here. All I need to do is press X on my keyboard to instantly flip the foreground and the background colors. So the reason why I bring this up is that this is something you'll do often when you're masking. You'll want to switch back and forth between two different values. Usually it's pure black and pure white, but if you're using two different grays in order to reveal or conceal parts of your mask, you're going to find it very handy to simply press X and switch your foreground and your background colors. In other words, to switch between revealing or concealing your layer. So right now I'm set to white. I can start brushing over this square we drew out earlier to reveal this layer more, or I can simply press X to get my black brush and paint over a little more to hide that layer. So when you're applying an actual adjustment to your photograph, you're going to find it very handy to instantly switch back and forth between your foreground and your background color. It makes your masking super simple and fast once you get used to it. Now here's where this workflow gets really powerful with the brush tool. If you need to add gray to your mask, which is often because you want to make certain parts of your layer semi-transparent, you don't have to keep changing your foreground color to a different shade of gray. So let me go ahead and just get rid of this layer mask and add a fresh one here. So as we've already gone over, the shade of gray you choose as your foreground color, that's going to determine how transparent that layer is. So if I go up here and choose 67% gray, that's gonna make this orange layer 33% visible. But if I decide, oh, you know what? This is a little bit too transparent. I wanna bring that back a bit. I don't have to go up to the slider and then bring it down a little bit and repaint over that area with a new shade of gray. That becomes very tiresome having to manually set the shade of gray you're using. The opacity of your pure black brush also works as a way to add gray to your image. So let me demonstrate that. Instead of choosing a different shade of gray, I'm going to press D to get my defaults and X to switch my foreground to black. So right now if I paint on the mask, I'm at a full 100% black. So that layer is 100% hidden. If I go up here to my opacity slider for the brush tool and bring that down to 67% opacity. That's gonna give me the same exact effect as choosing a shade of gray that is 67%. Actually, you know what? Let me start over with a fresh layer mask here so you can really see how there is no difference here. Okay, so I got a new fresh 100% white mask. I'm gonna drag out my marquee tool, draw a square right here. Got my brush color set to 67% gray. I'm gonna fill that in. With that, then I'm gonna drag out another square with my rectangular marquee tool. I'm gonna to take my brush again, choose 100% black, but bring my opacity down to 67%, and let's do the same thing. The effect is gonna be identical. If we take a look at the actual mask here, both those gray boxes are set to 67%. So the point of explaining this is that it makes your workflow so much easier just being able to control the opacity of that black brush rather than having to manually select a different shade of gray for your foreground color. Instead, you can just use a pure black brush all of the time and control the shade of gray with your opacity. So the practical use of this is that you can start with a very low opacity brush and gently build up the masking effect. You don't have to go in at a full 67% or whatever opacity level you choose. Since the opacity or the transparency of that brush is at a very low level, you can make several passes to build up that paint to full coverage. So let's go back to that orange layer here. Let me take my brush, 67% opacity. Let's bring that down to right around 25. Now I'll make my first pass here, and that's a very light effect. So if I want it stronger, in order to reveal the layer underneath, I can make another pass. Then I can go ahead and do another, another. So I'm gently building up that effect so it's very soft, tapered, but also has a tremendous amount of control here because I'm not going at it at full strength. I'm building it up as I go along. And that's where the real power of the brush tool comes in for masking. I mean, yes, you can use your other tools to make a selection and fill that selection in, like I've demonstrated with the marquee tool. And we'll get into other selection tools later that are pertinent to landscape photography, such as a luminosity mask. But when it comes to situations where you can just paint over where you want to mask, a black brush at a lower opacity works very well. 
Now, typically, when you're brushing onto a layer mask, you're blending in adjustment layers for a desired effect. For example, let me hide this layer here and go back to our curves adjustment that we did earlier to boost the blues in the sky and add a little bit more interest to the rocks in the foreground. This is something you would typically do to your photograph. And for adjustments like this, the best results typically come from very smooth, tapered brush strokes that are built up over several passes, like I just demonstrated. For example, let me hide this adjustment and go ahead and add a hue and saturation adjustment layer. Bring up the saturation quite a bit for the sky here. And let's say I just want to increase saturation of the sky, but not the foreground. I could take my marquee tool, drag it out over here, and then fill that part of the layer mask with full black. And that basically gives me the effect I'm going for. However, if we zoom in very close to the horizon line, you can see that the line of that selection is very obvious. So everything below this line or below the boundary of our selection here has now been desaturated and the saturation is now just restricted to the sky. So this transition is not ideal. Usually what you want to do, let's get rid of that layer mask and try again, is to use your brush tool, fill with black, and just gently brush over the area you want to effect. So in this case, I want to remove the saturation from my foreground. So I'm brushing black over here and I'm gently building up that effect. So if we take a look at the layer mask now, you can see that the edge here is very soft and the transition is very light. It's been gently built up. If we look at the actual image here, you can't see that transition line anymore where we go from saturated to unsaturated. So this variation of opacity, or rather this feather transition from your layer at 100% opacity to whatever transparency level you want it set at, that transition zone is what makes your effect appear natural. Now again, I go into much more detail in my lesson on smoother brush strokes, which will explain how to use brush opacity, hardness, and size to control how your brush work appears. And I'll put a link below to a free course that I have on Lightroom and Photoshop, which has that lesson. However, there will be times where this tapered effect is not desirable. For example, you may be exposure blending and you need the opacity of your layer mass transparency to be at a constant. You don't want these varying levels of transparency. So the obvious solution to this would be to use a brush at 100% opacity so you don't have that gentle buildup effect. So if your brush is a pure 100% black, you're making that layer 100% transparent wherever you paint. And if you choose a specific shade of gray as your color and paint onto the mask, you are making the content of that layer a certain percentage level of transparent. So either way, there is no buildup of your brushwork. The transparency level will be at a constant, no matter how many times you pass over it because the brush itself is at 100% opacity. Because sometimes you want the same opacity level across your entire mask and do not want that gentle buildup effect, that feathered effect we just demonstrated. So for this particular situation, setting your brush color to a gray is actually desired as opposed to using a low opacity brush. So here's a big point of all of that and where it all comes together. If you want your layer mask to be 100% transparent where you paint, then you would use a 100% black brush at full opacity. That's very simple and something we've demonstrated a few times in this video. However, most of the time, you want to use a shade of gray as your brush color to achieve a somewhat transparent effect. But deciding on the correct shade of gray, that can be a bit difficult. What if you have to change that shade later on in order to make your layer more or less transparent? It's really hard to know that ahead of time. So a much better way to maintain a constant transparency level with your brush tool is to change your layer mask density right here under the properties panel. Make sure to click on the layer mask and the density slider will show up under your properties panel. The density slider acts like an opacity slider for the layer mask itself. So what you can do here, actually, let me disable this layer. Let's go back to our orange fill layer because it really helps to visualize how this works. I'm going to add a new layer mask here. And let's go over to my marquee tool again. Let's drag out a rectangle. And let's fill this rectangle with pure 100% black so we can see the layer underneath. So let's say later on I decide, you know what? This orange layer, it's too transparent. I want it to be somewhat visible over the selection I drew out for the mask. So instead of having to reselect this area again and then choose a shade of gray in order to make that orange layer more visible there, all I have to do is go over to the layer mask properties and reduce the density or the strength of that mask. And once I reduce that density, two things have happened. First, the orange layer here is now more visible over that area. But look at the mask itself. Before this was pure black, now it's a shade of gray. 
So not only is it much easier to simply use your density slider, as opposed to trying to figure out what shade of gray to pick for your layer mask, but this is 100% non-destructive. I can come back to this layer mask and increase the density at any time or reduce it further. So you make all sorts of changes like this that are very helpful. And also I want to point out that the navigator window is very helpful when you're working on a mask because most of the time you want to be able to see exactly where you are brushing or rather exactly where you are masking by looking at the mask itself on your image. But you can also use the navigator window here to get an idea of what your image will actually look like once you go back to it and click off of the mask. All right, so getting back to the layer mask density here, let me bring that density back up to 100%. Now, if you wanted to do the opposite, let's say you want to keep your brushwork here at 100% transparency, but you want to reduce the visibility of the remainder of your layer. So in other words, the parts of the layer which are 100% white. So any area that has not been affected by the mask, if you want to reduce the strength of that, you can simply reduce the opacity of the entire layer itself. So I click on the layer thumbnail, not the mask, but the layer, go up to opacity, I can reduce that to make the entire layer less visible. So the masked out area remains the same. That's 100% invisible already. But any part of your image that is not masked out at 100% black, the strength of that will be reduced by the layer opacity slider. So that's the difference here. It's really simple to use and highly customizable. So the point of all this is that between your layer opacity, your brush opacity, and the layer mask density, you can really fine tune your results and not have to worry about picking the right shade of gray for your brushwork. So when you work with a layer mask, it can be very difficult to see what your mask actually looks like just by looking at the thumbnail here. So in order to accurately customize a mask to the unique content of your image, you'll often need to reference the actual mask as you go along. So as I've shown a few times throughout this tutorial, in order to bring up your layer mask and display it over your image, simply alt click on the mask itself the layer mask thumbnail here in the layers palette. And this will display the mask separate from the layers in your image. So now you can see that the white black areas of this mask here, as you do your masking work, and you can edit directly onto the mask as you're looking at it. So I take my marquee tool again and let's drag out a square here, get my brush out, bring down the opacity, and let's fill that with a shade of gray. So here we're looking at the actual layer mask and this area right here is 100% invisible. And this area right here is only 34% invisible. If we go back to the actual image, that is reflected right here on the photo. Now, if you wanted to move your mask to another layer, there are a few ways you can do that. For example, let me turn this layer off and turn these two adjustment layers back on again. Let's say I decide, you know what? This hue saturation adjustment, I would like to take this layer mask and apply it also to this adjustment layer. So we get rid of this mask here. So if you want to copy a layer mask to another adjustment layer, which is something you'll do a lot, simply hold down the Alt key, click and hold on the layer mask thumbnail, drag it up until a blue line outlines the layer you want to copy that mask to, and then release. So now both these layers have an identical mask. Now if you want to simply move a mask from one layer to another, you don't hold the Alt key, just simply click and hold on the layer mask, and do the same thing. You click and drag and hover over that layer until that blue box shows up, release, and now the layer mask has been moved. Now, if you want to disable a layer mask, rather make the entire mask invisible so you can see a before and after of your adjustment, simply hold down the shift key, click on the layer mask, and an X will appear through it, indicating that the mask is still here. It hasn't gone away. It hasn't been removed, but it's just been disabled. So it's the same thing as controlling the visibility of the actual layer. But instead of making the layer and the mask both invisible, you're just making the mask invisible. And then once you're done evaluating, you can shift click on the layer mask again in order to bring it back. Now, if you want to remove a layer mask completely, just delete it from your photograph and start over. You can right click on it, select delete layer mask, or you just simply click and drag until you hover over the trash can, then release and that mask will go away. Now, whichever method you use, you got to make sure you are selecting the layer mask and not the layer itself. Because if I clicked on the layer thumbnail here and drag that down to the trash can, I'm going to get rid of both the layer mask and the associated layer. You can also save a layer mask for later use by just simply adding it to an empty layer and disabling it. So let's say I don't like this adjustment. I want to add a new one but I want to save this mask for something later on. All you need to do is create an empty layer, click and drag and move the mask to that layer, and maybe put it down at the bottom of your photograph or create a group and put it in that group and rename it to something like save layer mask. 
then of course make sure to disable it just in case but that's not going to make a difference here so it's a great way to set a layer mask aside and have it right there so you can access it very quickly okay so let me disable these two adjustment layers here because they're a little bit too distracting now another point i want to make sure you understand is that you're not limited to one shade for your layer mask as you probably noticed throughout this tutorial if i turn this orange fill layer back on and let's I'll click on the layer mask itself so we can see it. This box right here is 100% black, which is like adding a temporary hole to the layer it's attached to. And then we have this 50% gray box, which shows the layer you are masking at 50% and then revealing the layer underneath at 50%. So we have two different lightness levels on the same layer mask. That's a really important concept to understand, especially later on once we get into luminosity masks, which will have many different lightness and levels throughout the entire mask. So I just want to make sure that's very clear that you can have different shades of gray on the same layer mask. Okay, let's go back to the image here. I'll disable this layer. So another tool we can use to create a selection for our layer mask, in other words, to control which areas are visible and which areas are transparent, is the gradient tool. The gradient tool works a lot like the graduated filter over in Lightroom or ACR, in the sense that you can create a truly tapered and smooth blend between your layers, much smoother and cleaner than what can be achieved with your brush tool. So instead of working with this orange color fill layer, let's take a look at a real world example of when you want to use a mask to blend in a pixel layer with another pixel layer. Okay, so let's switch over to this image here. This is the original raw file of the photo we've been working with. And let's say I want to blend in a different sky. The original sky here is very uninteresting and lacks a lot of texture. So what I want to do is blend in a long exposure sky from another scene, this layer right here. So ideally what I want is to create a very soft and gradual transition from this sky layer to the foreground and the wall and the turret here of our original photograph. So let's turn the sky layer back on so we can see it. Let's add a new layer mask and go to our gradient tool, which is hidden under the paint bucket. So if you see the paint bucket up, right click on that to reveal the gradient tool. Any tool here in the layers palette, if you see a little triangle in the bottom right hand corner, that means there's a hidden sub menu of additional tools that are nested underneath it. So if I right click on any of these, you can see it brings up other options. Now, when you apply a gradient to a layer mask, what happens is that one side of your image will be 100% visible and the other side will be 100% invisible. And the transition between those two points will be very smooth, feathered, and completely seamless. So that's gonna work great for this image here where I want the sky of this layer to seamlessly blend into the foreground. As you can see, I have a very sharp horizon line here, so that's gonna work really well for this image. The gradient tool also works very well for exposure blending if I wanted to blend in a different bracket here of the same scene. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our first gradient. I'm gonna turn this layer back on, select my gradient tool. And you know what? I am gonna use a color orange fill layer first so you can actually see how this effect works. And then we'll come back to the sky layer and blend that in. So I got a new layer. I'm gonna fill that with that orange color. Let's add a layer mask, go back to the gradient. So up here in the tool option bar for the gradient tool, you're going to see a lot of options here that allow you to customize how your gradient is applied. So for the purpose of landscape photography though, you'll usually be adding a black and white gradient to a layer mask. So you want to make sure that your options up here reflect what you see on my screen. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to a regular black and white gradient. And make sure all the other options here look like my screen. So now that we have all our settings correct, let's alt click on our layer mask so we can see that. Set of the orange fill layer. Now much like the graduated filter over in Lightroom or ACR, all you need to do is click and drag across your frame. So I got my mouse right here, I'm gonna click and hold, and I'm gonna drag and you can see a line that starts to appear. This line represents the transition zone of your gradient, or rather the distance between the two colors of your gradient. So for the purpose of layer masking, we're determining the transition zone between pure black and pure white, your foreground and your background color. So the gradient here is not adding an actual gradient to your photograph. What we're doing here is adding it to a layer mask, which controls the transparency of that layer. Okay, so I've drawn out my transition zone. All I need to do is release the mouse, and we've now applied our gradient. You can see we have pure black on the left, pure white on the right, and the transition between those two colors is very soft, tapered, and feathered out. Now, when you're dragging out a gradient like this, sometimes it can be a bit tricky to draw out a completely level line. So what you can do is actually hold down the Shift key as you're drawing out your transition zone. So even though I'm pushing my mouse above and below that line, 
this line is being drawn out completely level. So the shift key will constrain that line to be level, either horizontally like this, vertically, or diagonally. So that's a little trick there when you're drawing out your gradient. Okay, so now we have our layer mask applied as a gradient. So let's take a look at how this appears on the actual photograph. So here on the left-hand side is 100% pure black. So the layer is completely invisible and we are seeing the layers underneath. And on the right-hand side of that gradient is 100% pure white. So that is revealing the layer it's attached to at 100% opacity. But look at how soft and natural the transition is between those two areas. That is the goal with the gradient tool. Let's go ahead and look at the layer mask again. I'm gonna grab my eyedropper. I want you to keep an eye on this bar right here because this will tell you the tonal value of the area that I'm sampling. If I click and hold, you can see I'm at 100% pure black, but watch that scale as I start to move into the transition zone. Notice how it effortlessly transitions from one value to another. This is very soft, smooth, and gradual, all the way to pure white. So this is why I use a gradient, because this level of smoothness, it's just not possible with the brush tool, especially if you need it completely level. I mean, it is possible with the brush tool, but not without a lot of work and mistakes made. The gradient tool makes it super easy to use. Now, if you make a mistake with your gradient, you don't have to delete the layer mask and start over. By default, you can only have one gradient on your layer or layer mask at any time. And watch what happens when I drag out a gradient on the same layer mask. Let me do a diagonal one here. So I'm determining my transition zone. I'm gonna release the mouse. And look at that, the gradient has been replaced. I didn't add another gradient to the mask. It simply replaces the existing one. So if you're not 100% happy with the gradient, simply drag out another one. It's very easy to do. Just keep going until you've created a gradient that you like. Okay, so let me go ahead and disable this layer and go back to our original goal, which is transitioning the sky layer into the foreground here. I'm gonna grab my gradient tool once again, select a layer mask I want to apply the gradient to. And remember anything above or before where you start to drag your transition line, that's gonna be 100% invisible because you're starting with a black color. And anything below or after the end of your line will be 100% visible. So in the case of this layer here, I want the sky to be visible and the bottom half to be invisible. It'll start my transition line right about here. So everything below it will be 100% invisible. I'm gonna click and drag, hold down my shift key in order to keep this line level and drag up to right around here, which is where I want the transition line to end. So let's see how this looks. Okay, it's looking pretty good, but I need to push the sky up a little bit more. So I'm gonna drag out another gradient I want my transition line to start right about here at the very top of the turret. So again, I'm holding down the shift key, clicking once, dragging up not too far because I don't want that transition line to be too great, that transition zone. I want that blend to be seamless, but it doesn't have to go very far here because the sky I'm blending in is a pretty good match for the sky of the original image. So it's not gonna be very obvious. Okay, it's looking a little better, but let's try again. I'm gonna bring my line down a little bit more right about here, holding down the shift key, Let's make the transition line a little bit less. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. So this blend is a 100% perfect. I do need to come in and remove some of the sky from the turret and then bring in some of the lawn exposure to cover these clouds here. But this is a great starting point. Let's take a look at the actual layer mask here. You see we have that very soft, let me zoom in a little bit, very soft and tapered transition. And it's a very solid starting point for only a few seconds of actual work. Let's go back to the image here. What I can do is take a big soft black brush at a low opacity. Let's keep this right around 30% or so. And let's just start brushing onto our layer mask in order to remove that sky just from the turret here. Then we can go ahead and move over to the right side, switch that brush to white, which is going to reveal that sky layer over here to cover those original clouds. So that is looking much cleaner. Let's go over to the left hand side and check this out. That's looking pretty good. I should take a black brush and remove a little bit from this wall here. That's looking very nice and seamless. Let's zoom out to fit. Take a look at the actual layer mask that we've amended with the brush tool. That's looking fantastic. And when you're actually doing this in real time, probably only takes a minute or two in order to blend these two layers together seamlessly. And that's another point I want to mention is that the selection method you use for your mask, whether it's a brush tool or a gradient or your marquee tools or luminosity mask, as we'll discuss later, there are a lot of tools here at your disposal. And any tool you use can simply be a starting point for your masking in order to get the bulk of the work out of the way. You can always switch your selection tools and use more than one on the same layer mask. So for this image here, the gradient tool was an excellent starting point, but I can come back with my brush tool or any other tool I choose and clean up a few spots where I want a stronger transition. 
Now, if we started with the brush tool exclusively, it will take a lot longer to get to this point. And once we get into luminosity mass later, you'll understand this concept better, how to use multiple selection tools to get the results you want. Now, one feature of Photoshop that can be very helpful in visualizing exactly where you're painting your mask, or rather exactly where you are making a selection for your mask to hide or reveal parts of your layer is the mask overlay. Now, we've already gone over how to display the actual layer mask itself, so you can see which parts of your layer are being masked out. All you need to do is hold down the Alt key and click on the layer mask. However, this is only practical as a reference to check as you are masking. Because when you display the layer mask like this, you cannot see your actual image. Sure, you can reference the navigator up here, but that's very small, and it would be much better to view your image on the canvas here as you are masking. Now, if I click on my layer thumbnail here to go back to our image, then click the mask, grab my paintbrush, zoom into a problem area here, and let's say I need to mask out more of the sky layer over my rock. So I have my black brush here, and I'm painting over these rocks here, but there's another problem. Sometimes the layer you're masking isn't much different than the underlying layer, so you can't really tell where you are brushing. So as I'm doing this, it's like, okay, it kind of looks like I'm removing the sky, but how can I be sure? How can I keep track of my brushwork as I'm painting onto this layer mask without having to switch back and forth here to looking at the mask itself? This is where the mask overlay comes in. All I need to do is press the backslash key, and let me zoom out to fit here so we can see the entire image. This will turn on a red overlay that will show you the areas of your layer that are being masked out. In other words, areas that are being painted with black. So this gives you a visual map of your mask as this overlay. So you can still see your layers, the layer you are masking and the underlying layers, but it's strong enough to see where your mask work actually is. So right now I can see, okay, I've masked out the entire wall here. I have the turret masked out and also these rocks here. So that's a pretty good selection. However, I can see that some of the sky layer is on my water here, which is something I don't want. And also notice that the transparency, or rather the strength of that red overlay, directly correlates to the transparency of your layer mask. So notice down here, we have a very strong red overlay, but up here, it's a very light pink. If we look at the actual layer mask here, we can see that translates to the opacity of that mask. See, we have a very gradual transition here of our mask transparency. If I go back to the mask overlay, we can see that gradual transition from the overlay as well. So that's really helpful because it gives you some kind of visual reference. Letting you know, okay, this mask down here is very strong, but up here it's tapered. So what I can do is take my black brush, Make sure I have my layer mask selected. Bring up the size a little bit. Just do a little brush work right here in order to mask out that sky layer over my water. So you can see the red overlay gets stronger and stronger until it better matches the red overlay down here. So I'll turn this overlay off by hitting the backslash key again. Do a quick before and after. This is before the brush work. But you can see that the horizon line here isn't very strong. It's pretty washed out, but by turning that overlay on and seeing that the mask wasn't very strong there, I was able to bring back some of that original content from my base photograph. So that is the practical use of your mask overlay. Sometimes when you're blending layers or applying adjustment layers, it can be hard to tell exactly where you are masking and you may not notice these problems until much further along in your workflow. So it does pay off to check with your overlay, especially when the layers are very similar like this. Now, another way you can better visualize your mask as you are looking at your photograph is to load the mask as a selection. Now, as we touched on earlier, the mask creation process can be broken down into two Two steps. The first step is to create the selection, or rather the outline, of where you want to mask. In other words, where on a specific layer you want to adjust the opacity. So for this layer here, we turn the overlay back on. We're hiding everything below the horizon line, the turret and the wall. So that's step one, to create that outline. And the second step is to fill that selection in with black, white, or gray on your layer mask. Now, when you load a mask as a selection by holding down the command key and clicking on the mask, we can now see what are called the marching ants. And these marching ants, they create an imaginary line that surrounds the pixels which are being masked out. Now, this line won't be printed or will otherwise fuse with your photograph. It's just another overlay that you can turn on or off that can help you better visualize where your mask is while still being able to see the photo at the same time. And this can often be easier to see than the rest 
red overlay. Now you can always change the color of your overlay if the red color here doesn't highlight the areas you want. Depending on the color of the photograph, the red can kind of blend in and won't stand out. So if you right click on the layer mask, go down to mask options, you can choose maybe a green or a blue or something else that stands out more depending on your photograph. But sometimes that overlay can still be difficult to see no matter what color you choose. So these marching ants can really help. Now what's different about these marching ants is that they will only surround pixels which are brighter than 50% gray on that mask. Not the brightness of the actual photograph here, but the value that pixel has been assigned on the mask, whether it's white, black, or gray. In other words, it'll only surround pixels of that layer mask, which are visible by more than 50%. If we take a look at the layer mask here, let me turn off the overlay and then alt click on the layer mask so we can see that. Notice how the marching ants closely match the contours of the layer mask. And this is because this mask is pretty straightforward. It's mostly black and mostly white. All of the pixels here above the horizon line are brighter than 50% gray. So the marching ants are a pretty good match here. However, watch what happens when we go over to the gradient here. Let me all click on this layer mask and then command click on the mask to bring up an updated selection with these marching ants. Notice how the marching ants do not surround the darker gray pixels. The selection line is pretty much split right down the middle of this gradient where any pixel that is brighter than 50% gray is enclosed by the marching ants. And the darker pixels, those pixels on the top side of this gradient, those are being excluded. So that's the thing to keep in mind when you load your layer mask as a selection is that some pixels outside of those marching ants can still be visible, but just at a lower opacity level. This can be useful though when you want to get a better idea of where the stronger selections of your mask are or the areas which are the most visible and still be able to see your photograph. So if we go back to the image here, let's turn off that overlay and load this mask as a selection. This instantly tells me where the most visible pixels are on my photograph for that specific layer. I find this useful at times, so I wanted to mention it before moving on. Just make sure that when you're finished to deselect by pressing Command D, which will remove that selection. Because if you keep that selection loaded and active, you're telling Photoshop that you only want to affect the pixels which are being selected. That's what a selection is. You're outlining the pixels you want to adjust. So it's really just like creating a stencil. So with this image here, if I went ahead and added a new adjustment layer, let's go down here and add a new curves adjustment layer. Look at what happens to that new mask. It's being masked out automatically because that selection was loaded and active. Photoshop is interpreting this as you wanting to target your adjustment to that active selection. And that is something that confuses many photographers as they begin to work with selections. They have a selection loaded and active and they don't realize it. So they have no idea why their masks are being limited by this invisible stencil here. So always press Command D to clear out that active selection. Okay, let's jump back to our original finished photograph here with the adjustment layers. So the next practical use of a layer mask that I'd like to show you is how to repurpose a layer mask to cut down on the mask creation process. Going back to this image here, for this adjustment layer here with the mask that occurs adjustment layer, if you remember, do quick before and after here, we added some nice contrast to the sky and deepened those blues a little bit. And we also added a little bit of that to some of the rocks here in the foreground. And if we all click on the layer mask itself, we can see exactly which parts of our photograph are being affected. Now, one thing I would like to do is warm up the sand in the foreground here. This will help to add contrast with the cooler rocks and the cooler sky. So let me go ahead and do that with a color balance adjustment layer. Warm it up with the yellows a little bit and add some red as well. So this is getting nice and warm. Now what I could do here is create a new mask that selects everything but the rocks in the sky. In other words, I want to paint black to conceal the sky and the rocks, leaving the sand to absorb this color balance adjustment layer. However, since we've already created a layer mask targeting the exact opposite of what I want to adjust here, I can simply copy that layer mask, I'm gonna hold down the Alt key, click and hold on the layer mask, and then drag up until I'm over my new color balance adjustment layer. I'm gonna release and confirm that I want to replace this layer mask. Then all I need to do is press Command and I in order to invert that layer mask. So now if we take a look at the layer mask, the exact opposite is happening here. I have black for my sky, which means I'm not adjusting that sky at all. I'm concealing this layer onto the sky. Then I have a slight removal of this color balance adjustment layer on the foreground rocks. So we take a look at the image here. This is before the layer mask, and here is the after. And I can go ahead with a stronger black brush. Let's turn on my mask overlay here. I can remove this adjustment even more from those rocks in the foreground. 
So here's before the layer mask, and here is the after, and this is before the adjustment layer. And here is the after warming up the sand and most of the foreground. So this is very useful and it's something I do often because even if an existing mask is not a perfect fit for the areas you want to adjust, you can always adjust your mask at any point in time in order to tailor it to the content of your image, like you just saw me do with my black brush. The selection wasn't strong enough for the rocks, so all I needed to do was grab a black brush and paint over those rocks more heavily. However, most of the work was already done in the original layer mask here for our curves adjustment layer. So the point here is, as you are creating your image, always look at your existing masks to see if they provide a starting point for the adjustment you want to make. And it's a great time saver because usually we are targeting the same areas for different adjustments. So another way you can use a layer mask is to add it to a group, or rather a folder that you've created in your layers panel that has different layers nested within it. This is really powerful. So I want to show you how group masking works. So let's say that I want to make a few different adjustments just to the sky. So let me add a few different adjustment layers here. I'm not gonna do anything with them. I'm just going to add them to my layers palette. So I have a curves, a brightness contrast, hue saturation, and let's grab a levels adjustment layer. So I have these one, two, three, four layers that I want to mask so that the adjustment only affects the sky. So let's take our first adjustment here and let's say I just wanna add a little bit of contrast to those clouds, but obviously I only want that towards the sky. So I'm gonna take my black brush. So I'm gonna press D to set my default foreground and background colors. I'm gonna grab my gradient tool and let's drag this out so that it's hidden from most of my foreground here. Pull down the shift key so that I'm drawing a level transition line. Let's take a look at the mask itself. And that's pretty good. It slowly tapers off towards the sky. Now, if I wanted to apply the same layer mask to my other three adjustment layers, the obvious choice would be to hold down the option key and then just replace all four layer masks like this. Now, that doesn't take too long. But an even better solution would be to put all these layers into the same group and then copy over the mask from this first adjustment layer to the group itself. So let me back up a few steps here. I'm going to select all four layers, add them to a group, open up the group itself. I'm going to take this layer mask, I'm going to click and hold and drag it because I want to simultaneously remove it from this adjustment layer and add it to the group itself. Make sure my mouse is over the word group, release. And now that layer mask that we created for our first adjustment layer here is now applied to the group itself. And since the group itself is now governing all four of those adjustment layers, the mask will automatically be applied to those adjustment layers. Now the benefit of this is that we can now add additional adjustment layers for the sky inside of this group without having to copy over the mask over and over again to those new adjustment layers. So for example, let me click on the group here and add a new adjustment layer. Let's just add a levels here. And let's say I want to make a really wild adjustment to my levels just to demonstrate how this works. So see the adjustment I'm making is only being applied to the sky now, even though the adjustment layer itself doesn't have any content on the layer mask because it's inside of this group and the group itself has a layer mask that trickles down and is automatically applied to any layer you put inside of that group. And the best part about this is that later on, if you need to refine this group mask, well, first, let me disable this adjustment layer because it's really distracting. So later on, if you need to adjust this group mask, let's say, you know what? I want to redo that gradient so that it's applied a little bit more towards my foreground here like this. So I just added a new group mask here. And that's going to automatically be applied to any adjustment layer that's inside of that group. Now, if I had to redo that mask for the individual layers, I'd have to copy that layer mask to all of my adjustment layers. Now, we only have five here, so it's not that big of a deal. But later on in your workflow, you could easily have 10, 15, or 20 adjustment layers for a particular area of your photograph. So by simply amending the group mask instead of the individual layer mask, that can save you a ton of time. So not only are groups a way to organize your adjustment layers, but the group mask is a fantastic way to streamline your workflow. And what's even better, and we'll get into this later on when we talk about luminosity masks, is that you can do what is called masking the mask, which is a way for you to have two different masks on a particular layer or adjustment layer. So right now I have this group mask that is restricting the adjustment just to the sky. So any adjustment layer inside of it is only going to affect our sky. 
So going back to this original curves adjustment layer here, we add a little bit of contrast being applied to the sky. Now if I decide later on that, you know what, this curves adjustment layer, I don't need it applied to the stone wall here in the turret. So I want to mask that out. All I need to do is come back with a black brush, click on the adjustment layer mask and just paint that out to remove that adjustment from this area here. However, since this mask is attached to the individual adjustment layer and not the group itself, it's only going to affect that curves adjustment layer. This will not affect any other layer within that group. So the group mask itself allows you to restrict all the adjustments or layers within that group to one area and then you can go into those individual adjustment layers or pixel layers and further mask them out based on what that individual layer does to your photograph. So this is extremely powerful. Once we get into the lessons on luminosity masks, you're really going to see how versatile this environment is, being able to add two different masks to an individual layer. All right, so before we wrap up this deep dive into layer masking, I'd like to go over a few additional topics here on how to better manage your layer masks. Now, when you're working with multiple layers and layer masks, one of the most common mistakes to make is not having the correct layer or layer mask selected for an adjustment. I know I've discussed this a few times, but it's so important to ensure that you have the correct layer or layer mask selected when you make an adjustment. For example, if you want to use your brush tool to hide an adjustment layer from your photograph, you'd want to paint black onto that layer mask. However, if you have a different layer selected by mistake, let's say I have the actual photograph selected, and I start painting black onto that photograph, this isn't going to look very good. And also, this is a destructive change as you're painting onto the photograph itself. So when photographers are new to layers and masking, it can be very hard to keep track of which layer you have selected and active. And then mistakes like this are made and it just becomes frustrating. And I spent many years now tutoring photographers on how to use Photoshop, and this is a mistake I see made over and over again. So before you make any kind of adjustment to your layers or your layer masks, always double check to make sure you have the correct layer or mask selected in your layers palette. There are two visual indicators of that. The first one is the background for your layer. This gray box here will be slightly lighter than the other layers in your palette. We see how this pixel based layer, this photograph has that lighter gray. So that's telling me, oh, okay, I'm applying my brush tool or whatever tool you're using to that layer, which is not what I want. I want to go up here and mask out this curves adjustment layer. So I'm going to click on that. However, that gray background is not always enough. You also need to make sure that you either have the layer itself or the layer mask selected, depending on what you want to do. Since this is an adjustment layer and I want to paint onto the layer mask, I'm going to make sure that the mask is selected by clicking on that thumbnail. And I know I have my mask selected because that white box is surrounding the layer mask thumbnail. So the point here is that if your results are not as expected, always double check to make sure you have the correct mask or layer selected. You really do need to get into the habit of looking for this white box surrounding the layer or the layer mask thumbnail because that indicates your active selection. Usually it's not a big deal if you make a mistake, but if you inadvertently painted onto a pixel layer like this photograph and you didn't realize it until much later in your workflow, you may not be able to undo that change. So speaking of selecting, another mistake I often see photographers make is when you're trying to access the right click menu for additional options. Let's say you want to duplicate a layer into another Photoshop document. That's very common. And that option is accessed by right clicking on the layer itself. So you see my mouse is over the gray background for that layer I want to duplicate. I'm going to right click, go up to duplicate layer. Then I can decide to rename the layer and then also determine which open Photoshop document I want to send that copy to. However, notice when I right click on the layer mask, we have a different menu that pops up that is specific to the layer mask itself. You can choose to disable or delete the layer mask and some other options down here. However, that duplicate layer option is not available because that is under a different menu. Then also if we click on the layer thumbnail for our photograph here, we have a third menu that comes up and this is specific to the layer itself. You can assign a color to your layer. You can change the size of the thumbnail and then also access your layer blending options. So the point here is that there are three different menus depending on where you click on the layer itself. So if the menu you are looking at isn't what you expected or you can't find the option you are looking for, make sure you are right clicking in the right place. Either the layer itself, the layer mask, or the layer thumbnail. 
Now, another tip I have for you is that when you press Command I on your keyboard, that's going to invert your layer mask, which is very useful if you ever want to target the opposite of what your layer mask is currently targeting. So for example, this layer mask right here, let's take a look at it. This is restricting this adjustment layer to everything but the rocks and the tart along the horizon line here. However, if I wanted to invert that by pressing Command I, so I see the mask has been inverted. Now this adjustment is being applied to only the rocks and the tart along the horizon line. This is something you'll use often in your workflow because it's very easy to simply copy a layer mask to adjustment layer, invert it, then be able to make an adjustment to the opposite areas that you are masking. Then of course you can come back and tailor that mask as necessary. You can paint onto it or otherwise further adjust it. Or if the mask is too restrictive, you can come over to the properties panel and reduce the density of that layer mask. But copying and inverting it is a great starting point. And on that same note, sometimes you may find it easier to start with a 100% black mask and paint in the areas that you want that layer to be visible on, if the area is only a small part of your frame. So this curves adjustment layer, what I can do, let me replace this layer mask. What I can do is hold down the Alt key while I add a new mask. That's going to automatically add a black mask. So it's hiding the adjustment for my entire photograph now. Now we can come in with a white brush. And let's say I only want this adjustment to be visible on the rocks here in the foreground. I just have my white brush, paint in that adjustment only on the areas I wanted to. Maybe add a little more contrast to those areas in the properties panel. Quick before and after, and here we go. That adjustment has only been applied to the areas I've painted on my layer mask. Now, if I were to try to achieve this mask by first starting with a white mask and then painting black into it, that wouldn't take too long to do. You just need to fill the mask in with black with your bucket tool and then paint white. But I find it easier to simply add a black mask by holding down the Alt key while I am adding a new layer mask. Okay, one final tip before we wrap this video up is that I want to make sure you know how the layer properties work. So as you may have noticed, the properties panel over here will reflect the specific settings for that layer. If I click on the photograph layer, I have settings for a pixel based layer. And then if I click on the color balance adjustment layer, I have settings for that particular adjustment. And same thing with curves, brightness, contrast, levels. It'll always change depending on which layer you have selected. So the properties panel is your control station for your layers or adjustment layers. Now, if you click on a layer mask, not the layer itself, but the actual mask, the properties panel will change to reflect layer mask specific settings. Here you can control the feather and density of your entire mask, which is very important and useful because these adjustments are non-destructive. Let's take a look at the layer mask here for a second. If I increase the feathering in order to soften the effect of the mask, we feather it up like this, you can really see a difference here. So if I wanted to blur the edges of the selection that I've made for the mask in order to soften the transition, I can easily do that with the feathering slider. But the powerful part of this is that I can come back to this layer mask at any time and reduce the feathering all the way down to the original content of the mask. So this is a non-destructive change as opposed to manually blurring out the layer mask with my blur tool, which would be a permanent destructive change. And the same thing with the density, or rather the opacity of the mask. Instead of coming back and painting a lighter gray onto my mask, I can simply control it with the density, which will reduce how strong the entire layer mask is being applied to the layer. So that's just something to keep in mind, is that the properties panel for the layer mask has some pretty powerful tools for further refining how you want your layer mask to look. It really gives you a huge advantage. All right, so that is going to wrap up this lesson on layer masks. I hope you found this helpful and that it cleared up some questions for you on how layers and masks work together to create the image you want. So understanding layers and layer masks, it's really fundamental to a landscape photographer. And it's the stepping stone to understanding the most powerful tools in Photoshop such as luminosity masks, which allow you to automatically create selections based on the tonal value of your photograph. For example, if I wanted to create a layer mask that targeted just the darker tones of my sky here, those blues, but exclude the brighter white clouds, that would be virtually impossible to do with a layer mask. Turn on my mask overlay here and let's grab a black brush. So if I wanted to create a selection here, that was just for the white clouds, but not the sky, I could get roughly the area I want, but notice how there's a lot of blue sky in with these clouds, and it'd be very hard to trace along the exact areas you want to select. 
So this is very sloppy. It just becomes a huge project to make a selection like this. With a luminosity mask, you can create a selection like this automatically. It's 100% contoured to the unique content of your image. So in comparison, let me go down to a layer that I've hidden here with a luminosity mask. This is something I created earlier for this particular image. Notice how the clouds are perfectly selected and the sky is perfectly masked out or rather deselected. So now I can go ahead and use this mask to make an adjustment that is completely targeted for my clouds. Or if I wanted to adjust the sky instead, all I need to do is press command I to invert that mask. And now the sky or rather the blue of my sky is selected very strongly and the clouds are excluded. And this only took probably about five seconds to create. So as you can tell, if I wanted to create a tailored, customized selection like this with my brush tool, it would be virtually impossible. Or at the very least, it would take a massive amount of time to accomplish and the results wouldn't be as strong. And the best part is that you already know how layers and masks work, which is 90% of learning how luminosity masks work. The only difference with luminosity masks is that you need to understand how it selects your tonal ranges automatically versus making manual selections with your brush tool or your other selection tool like we've been going over so far and knowing when and why to use them because with the luminosity mask all that is it's just a selection and what you do with that selection is limitless everything else is very simple to understand so congratulations on making it this far because you've already reached the top of the photoshop mountain everything else is downhill from here so before you go, make sure to download the practice files as well as the cheat sheet. There is a download link underneath this video for that. Now the goal of the practice files is so you can get hands on with layers right away because that will help you retain all the information taught here in this video. Once you actually go through the motions yourself, there have been countless studies that show the quicker you can apply a new skill, actually do it yourself, the easier it is for you to remember it. And the cheat sheet here, it's an excellent reference that drills down all the important bullet points that I covered in this video. And it's great for when you need a quick refresher. And I've also included timestamps to this video in the cheat sheet. So if you download the video as well and you need to rewatch a certain topic, you don't have to search for the entire video. You can just jump to that specific section. All right. Thanks so much for joining me and I will see you in the next video.